This presentation will focus on responses made by an applicant after a final office action is issued, particularly the procedure required following the submission of an applicant's reply after final rejection. This will include the potential responses and actions that may be issued by you, the examiner. Particular emphasis will be given to examiner's amendments, advisory actions, and RCEs. Applicant can reply to a final office action in a number of different ways. Within the time period for reply presented in the final office action, applicant may submit an after-final reply which contains amendments, requests for reconsideration, and or additional evidence used in an attempt to overcome any outstanding rejections or objections. Applicant may also choose to present the case in a different light through a request for continued examination. Finally, applicant may choose to submit a notice of appeal indicating the desire to present arguments to the Patent Trial and Appeal Board in the form of an appeal brief filed concurrently or subsequently to the notice of appeal. In this presentation, we will concentrate on the procedures surrounding an after-final reply and requests for continued examination. We will not be discussing the specific requirements for affidavits, notices of appeal, and appeal briefs, as these topics are addressed in other presentations. Replies after final go on the expedited section of your docket and have a shortened time clock running. You are expected to turn in a response to an amendment after final rejection within an average of 14 calendar days from the time you receive the amendment. Replies after final should only be considered if they are submitted within the shortened statutory period, or SSP, or are accompanied by a petition for an extension of time with the payment of the appropriate fee. When you issue a final office action, the applicant has a shortened statutory period of three months from the date of the mailing of the final rejection to provide a complete and proper reply. This period can be extended up to an additional three months with a petition and the appropriate fee. This slide covers some possible ways the USPTO may respond to an applicant's after-final reply. If the after-final reply does not place the application in condition for allowance, an advisory action may be issued, and the amendments may or may not be entered. If the after-final reply does place the application in condition for allowance, except for formal matters which are identified for the first time after a reply is made to a final office action, and which require action by applicant to correct, you may issue an ex parte quail action. If necessary to facilitate an allowance, an interview after final may be granted. And lastly, you may issue an examiner's amendment to correct any omission when a reply to a final office action substantially places the application in condition for allowance. We will discuss these responses in more detail in the following slides. When the after final reply does not place the application in condition for allowance, you must process and send an advisory action to applicant informing him or her of the disposition of the application. The advisory action informs applicant of the time period for reply and advises applicant of the disposition of the proposed arguments and the effect of any argument or affidavit not placing the application in condition for allowance. Keep in mind that applicant cannot, as a matter of right, amend any finally rejected claims, add new claims after a final rejection, or reinstate previously canceled claims. Amendments filed after final are not entered unless approved by you, the examiner, and are normally approved for entry only if they place the application in condition for allowance or in better form for appeal. An amendment filed after a final office action but before the filing of an appeal brief may be entered if it cancels claims, adopts suggestions made by you, removes issues for appeal, or in some other way requires only a cursory review. The amendment may also be entered upon a showing of good and sufficient reasons why the amendment is necessary and was not presented earlier or otherwise places the application in condition for allowance. For 
The event that a proposed amendment does not place the case in better form for appeal, nor in condition for allowance, applicants should be promptly informed of this fact. The refusal to enter the proposed amendment should not be arbitrary. Ordinarily, the specific deficiencies of the amendment need not be discussed. However, if the proposed amendment raises the issue of new matter, you should identify what is considered to be new matter. If the proposed amendment presents new issues requiring further consideration and or search, you should provide an explanation why the proposed amendment raises new issues that would require further consideration and or search. When processing an advisory action, indicate on the after final reply and or amendment whether or not the amendment and or reply is entered. Using the Annotate tab in PE2E Docket Application Viewer, put Do Not Enter or OK to Enter along with your initials and the date on the first page of the amendment. The cover form for an advisory action is PTOL-303. This form is used to communicate to applicant the status of the after final reply. This form has six different sections, each of which should be completed as appropriate. In the first section titled, No Notice of Appeal Filed, if applicant's complete first reply is filed after two months from the date of the final office action, Checkbox 1A at the top portion of the PTOL-303. The time period for reply is three months plus the number of months extension of time paid by applicant. If applicant's complete first reply is filed within two months of the date of the final office action, checkbox 1B at the top portion of the PTOL-303. The shortened statutory period for reply is the mailing date of the advisory action or the date set forth in the final rejection, whichever is later. Again, in no event will the statutory period for reply expire later than six months from the mailing date of the final rejection. This slide explains how to complete Form PTOL-303 if no notice of appeal was filed and applicant files a second reply in response to the final office action. If Box 1A was selected in the first advisory action, you should again select Box 1A at the top portion of the PTOL-303. If Box 1B was selected in the first advisory action and the first advisory action was mailed within three months from the date of the final rejection, you should check box 1A in the second advisory action, setting forth the time period for reply, including any extensions of time. Note that box 1B should never be selected in a second advisory action that follows the same final rejection. Box 1C should be selected only when all of the following conditions apply. 1. Applicant did not file a notice of appeal. 2. A first advisory action was issued in which Box 1B was selected. 3. Applicant timely filed a second after final reply in response to the same final rejection. And 4. The first advisory action was mailed more than three months after the mailing date of the final rejection. If Box 1C is selected in the second advisory action, enter the number of months paid for by the extension of time. This screen capture shows the selection of Box 1C and space to enter number of months before the period for reply expires. In the section entitled Notice of Appeal, check Box 2 if a Notice of Appeal was filed and enter the filing date of the Notice of Appeal. In the section titled Amendments, check Box 3 if the after final amendment will not be entered and Select all appropriate reasons for non-entry of the amendment. 
you should provide additional explanation if necessary in the notes section. In addition, box 7 must be completed to indicate that the proposed amendments will not be entered. If the amendment is entered, box 3 should not be completed. Instead, box 7 is completed to indicate that the proposed amendment is entered. Regardless of whether or not the proposed amendment will be entered, the status of the claims should be indicated in the section titled Status of the Claims. If applicant's reply includes an affidavit or other evidence, check the appropriate boxes in the section entitled Affidavit or Other Evidence to indicate entry or non-entry. Any arguments set forth by applicant are addressed in the section entitled Request for Reconsideration slash Other. An ex parte quail action may be issued when the after final reply places the application in condition for allowance, except for formal matters, which are identified for the first time after a reply is made to a final office action, and the formal matters require action by applicant to correct. An ex parte quail action closes prosecution in the application. When an ex parte quail action is issued, extension of time fees are not required, since applicants reply after final puts the application in condition for allowance, except for the correction of formal matters, which were not previously identified by the examiner. When possible, you should consider conducting an interview and writing an examiner's amendment, rather than an ex parte quail action, to resolve formal matters in order to issue an allowance. Interviews are conducted at your request or at applicant's request. Normally, applicant is permitted one interview after final rejection. If applicant requests an interview after final, then, prior to the interview, applicants should briefly present the intended purpose and content of the interview, preferably in writing using Form PTOL-413A. Such an interview may be granted if you are convinced that disposal or clarification for appeal may be accomplished with only nominal further consideration. Interviews merely to restate arguments of record or to discuss new limitations which would require more than nominal reconsideration or new search should be denied. Any interview conducted must include an examiner who has negotiation authority. Upon conclusion of the interview, an interview summary form PTOL-413 or PTOL-413B must be completed and made of record in the application. When a reply to a final office action substantially places the application in condition for allowance, you may request that the applicant authorize an examiner's amendment to correct the omission and place the application in condition for allowance. An examiner's amendment is most often used to cancel or amend claims. It may also be used to make formal corrections to the application, including the drawings and the specification. An examiner's amendment is included with a notice of allowability. Form PTOL-37. If a formal examiner's amendment is necessary to process the allowance, the examiner's amendment must be signed by a primary examiner and authorized by applicant in a formal interview. If an interview is conducted, you must also include the interview summary form to indicate the substance of the interview. When an examiner's amendment is made to the drawings, Applicant is still required to provide replacement drawings reflecting the changes made by the examiner. The requirement for corrected drawings appears on the Notice of Allowability. Examiner's amendment is proper even if it is issued more than three months from the date of the final office action, if a complete first reply is filed within two months of the date of the final office action. However, an examiner's amendment cannot be made after the six-month statutory time period. 
where a complete first reply to a final office action has not been filed within two months of the final office action. Applicant's authorization to make an amendment to place the application in condition for allowance must be made either within the three-month shortened statutory period or within an extended period for reply that has been petitioned and paid for by applicant. An examiner's amendment correcting only formal matters which are identified for the first time after a reply is made to a final office action would not require any extension fee since the reply to the final office action put the application in condition for allowance except for the correction of formal matters which were not previously identified by the examiner. When authorization to make a petition for an extension of time is given to you, the authorization must be given before the extended period of time expires. The authorization must be made of record in an examiner's amendment by indicating the name of the person making the authorization, when the authorization was given, the deposit account number to be charged, the length of the extension requested, and the amount of the fee to be charged to the deposit account. You may use Form Paragraph 13.02.02.